everyone for joining the 11th annual National Safety Stand Down to Prevent Falls in Construction. The Institute has a national alliance with OSHA for the past 21 years, and together we have been big supporters of the National Stand Down. So this year to help raise awareness and educate our industry and fall prevention, we are holding this webinar on leading edge safety. So before we begin today's webinar, I just want to remind everyone of some important post stand down reminders. Um, if you could, after your um, company has captured or has completed their stand down, if you could please report those numbers directly to me. We then report all of our participating companies. Um, we send those numbers directly to OSHA. So that's very important that after you have completed your stand down, that you download the sign-in sheet and capture um, all of the employees who attended. Um, also, another reminder, please take photos of your stand down and send those to me as well. If you do post those on LinkedIn or Instagram, please be sure to tag the Institute. And you can find all of the, the sign-in sheet, the downloadable sign-in sheet, and a bunch of other additional stand-down resources um, on our website, which is swrionline.org backslash standdown. All right, I am now going to toss the baton over to Carlos Noya, who is our safety committee chair, and he is going to um, walk you guys through some resources that the Institute, along with the safety committee, has put a lot of effort in developing these invaluable safety resources. So take it away, Carlos. Thank you, Nicole, um, and thank you for everything you've done to get this event together. Thank you to everybody else who put their time and energy into planning this event, making it a success. And thank you to everybody on this uh, for watching it and spending some time to try to learn and improve their safety, uh, especially with a focus on uh, fall and fall protection. Um, if we could, uh, Nicole, bring up the website. Yes. Um, so we've made some improvements to our swrionline.org homepage to make finding the um, safety resources slightly easier tap it'll say safety resources um, and you will have the drop down options um, one of which is our 37 OSHA approved trainings uh, we refer to them as uh, toolbox talks but they're actually a little bit more than a standard toolbox talk um, uh, beyond the practical uh, hands-on type of training the theory in there is quite thorough uh, they're available in both English and Spanish we also have available in the safety resources uh, past stand down webinars um, so different, uh, different resources from previous stand downs. Some of them might be links to kind of older information, but it should uh, set you on the right path to get to more uh, recent things. We also have in there a safety video library. Um, this comes from multiple sources like the CPWR. These are excellent videos for giving the fundamentals um, and they definitely can elevate any kind of field crews um, understanding or at the very least review some critical information. We also have some silica resources. They were largely developed uh, at the time that the silica rule was new and first in effect. Um, but the, meaning, the information in there is still meaningful and still valuable and still helpful. Then lastly, we have a downloadable version of the safety and health manual um, that is also customizable to members of the SWRI. Um, you can go in there if you're a member and put your logo in there. Uh, this manual is an excellent resource, especially for smaller entities that are just kind of getting used to all of the different safety standards. Um, it's very focused on our industry, put together with a lot of safety minds from our industry. And it's an excellent tool for uh, identifying best practices. So that said, um, we invite you to enjoy the presentations by Jose and Mike, and thank you to both of them for all their time and energy in making these very good presentations. I hope you enjoy them as much as I do. And I hope you'll take this information and bring it to your teams and utilize it to uh, make your team safer. And I'll hand it right back to Nicole to introduce our presenters. 
All right, thank you very much, Carlos. Introduce our first speaker, Jose, who is a safety and quality manager at GDA Contractors in Texas. Jose initiated his career in safety in 2013, and Jose is a member of the Estero Institute and actively contributes to the Institute Safety Committee. All right, Jose, take it away. Everyone, uh, today I'm excited uh, to discuss leading edge hazard as part of our National Safety Stand Down Week. My aim is to equip you with insights to assess hazards. Um, let's get started into this important topic. So, National Safety, National Safety Stand Down to Prevent Falls in Construction. So, falls are the leading cause of death in construction. When working from heights such as ladders, scaffolds, and roofs, employers and employees must ensure the job is done safely. So our topic today is gonna to be leading edge safety. So today's presentation will focus on leading edge hazards and the controls we can put in place to keep ourselves safe. So leading edge hazards are those risks we face when we're near edges of a surface or where there's a potential for a fall. Here I have an image that shows multiple uh, leading edge hazards when someone's working on a roof, just to get a better idea, a clearer picture of what some of those hazards you'll be faced with. So some of our objectives today is uh, hazard recognition. So we wanna recognize and identify potential hazards and risks in the workplace. Um, we're also gonna cover some of the controls. So implementing uh, and mitigating some of the, uh, some of the hazards. Uh, we'll also talk about different equipment uh, when working on leading edge and some key considerations um, to help you out whenever you're working on a leading edge. So we'll start with our first objective, which will be hazard recognition. So six feet and above the lower level. Employees working on a leading edge six feet higher or above the lower level must have protection from falls. This protection can, provide, can be provided by guardrail system, safety net systems, or personal fall protection systems. If there's no protection, if there are no guardrails or walls present between 39 inches to 45 inches, fall protection is required. Within six feet of the edge, working within six feet of unprotected edges is dangerous because it's easy to accidentally slip or trip and fall over the edge. Without proper protection like guardrails or safety nets, harness, workers could get seriously hurt or even killed if they fall. Within 15 feet of the edge, when working 15 feet or more from the edge of a roof, a warning line combined with effective work rules can prevent workers from approaching the edge. A warning line is placed 15 feet or more from the edge. The warning line meets or exceeds specific, specified requirements. No work occurs between the warning line and the edge. And employers are effectively instructed not to cross the warning line. We'll now cover some of the controls. Let's talk a little bit about restraint versus arrest. A personal, Personal fall arrest system refers to as a safety system employed to stop a worker from falling from a working level. It consists of an anchorage point, connectors, a harness. It may include a lanyard, acceleration device, lifeline, or a combination of these components. Things to consider when working with the fall arrest equipment. Total fall clearance, distance needed to avoid hitting the lower level. Free fall distance, how far a worker falls before being stopped. Acceleration distance, stretching of safety gear when stopping a fall. Workers' height and harness movement are important. And the length of a safety line and attachment height are crucial, especially if connected to stretching horizontal lifeline. Restraint. A fall restraint system effectively prevents workers from being exposed to fall hazards by limiting their ability to travel along elevated surfaces. Things to consider when working with uh, fall restraint equipment. Choose the right equipment. Make sure everything fits properly. Find secure anchor points, know the safe distance from edges, and train workers on equipment use. I'm gonna go a little bit more in depth about restraint. We're gonna talk a little bit about active and passive. So an active fall protection plan uh, stops uh, falls by using equipment like safety harness to arrest the worker's fall if they slip or trip. Restraint, passive. A passive plan prevents falls by addressing hazards such as installing guardrails or maintaining tidy work areas. Guardrails. A guardrail is part of a fall prevention system. So a top row height must be between 39 and 45 inches above the working level. 
There should be a mid row and a toe board. Guard row should withstand 200 pounds of force on the top row, 150 pounds on the mid row, and 50 pounds for the toe board. Equipment. Choosing the right fall protection equipment for working your edges is key. Make sure your gear can handle potential falls without breaking. Use strong anchors and tough lifelines or lanyards designed for edge work. Equipment inspections. Here's a simple guide to check the webbing on your equipment. Hold the webbing and bend it to look for cuts or damage. Use both side and touch to inspect for cuts, tears, or fraying, broken fibers or cracks, changes in texture or thickness. This coloration would indicate heat damage or mildew. Um, inspecting hardware is crucial. Here's what to look for. Check for twists, bends, or rough edges. Look out for rust, corrosion, cracks, or breaks. Ensure garments aren't broken or distorted. Make sure there are no modifications like extra hose. Check buckle parts for proper overlap and movement. Ensure rollers and bars move freely without any stiffness. Harnesses needed clear tags with important info like the model, manufacturer date, manufacturer's name, limitation, and warnings. Look for the manufacturer's date on the tag and retire the harness if it's past its service life policy. If the tag is missing or unreadable, take the harness out of service. Storage areas must be clean, dry, and free of fumes, heat, sunlight, and corrosive substances. Avoid storing harnesses near batteries to prevent chemical damage from potential leaks. Here we have a good example of a toolbox and where you can store your harness. Now let's cover a couple of key considerations with leading edge safety. Swing hazard. Improper use of fall protection can lead to swing falls, which occur when a worker using a personal fall arrest system falls while the anchor point isn't directly overhead. Instead of falling straight down as the lifeline stops, the worker swings towards the center of the anchor point. How do we prevent swing hazards? Stay near your anchor point to prevent swing falls. Keep your lanyard overhead and within 30 degrees of your anchor. Make sure your anchor is high enough uh, to limit free fall to six feet or less. Moving away from your anchor increases swinging and impact force. Here we have some examples of swing hazard. Now let's talk about rope grab placement. Position the rope grab correctly to avoid swing hazards. Ensure the arrow on the rope grabs points towards the anchor point. Always conduct a thorough inspection on your lifeline and your rope grab. So we're tracking lifelines. There are various types of SRLs, and it's crucial to choose the right one for leading edge conditions. There are two types of classifications. SRLs are classified into class one and class two. Class one SRLs are designed to be tied up above your head, while class two SRLs can anchor above or lower the dorsal ring, typically are your leading edge SRLs. Choosing the right one. There are specific types of SROs for different purposes. The standard SRO is designed for overhead use, but not for sharp edges. Then there is the SRO-LE, where LE stands for leading edge. And then you can have a SRO-R, where the R stands for rescue. Here we have some examples of the different types of SROs. Make sure your SRO has a proper symbol. Ensure you verify that they're using the correct SRLs. Here are some symbols to help you determine if the SRL is designed for leading edge use or not. That's all I have. Thank you. So now we are going to hand it over to Mike Wiley. Mike has more than 18 years experience in occupational safety and health management and access solution. He has extensive training in occupational safety and health and is a level three SPRAT certified technician. He also provides training for SPRAT L1 and L2 technicians. All right, take it away, Mike. Good afternoon. I'm Mike Wiley and I'm here to talk about anchors. So uh, I want to start out by defining what an anchor is. And an anchor is a fixed or temporary structure used to securely anchor a worker. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a permanent anchor or a uh, manufactured anchor. It could be all types of different things. It is just a structure 
that we attach something to, to a attach a person to. Um, when we move on from that, there are different types of anchors. The first one we'll talk about is permanent anchors. Now, permanent anchors are installed as a permanent fixture on buildings, bridges, towers, and they're designed to withstand the forces generated during a fall. They're often made of steel or aluminum, and they have specific uh, regulations that uh, permit the use of um, permanent anchor systems. And we'll talk more about that later on in this presentation. Um, I do have some pictures here of different types. So this is a uh, permanent fixed anchor. As you'll see here, it's a stanchion type anchor. Uh, that would go down, uh, probably, this was probably a CRA 8 or a CRA 12, that goes down below the uh, the foam on the roof and is, is tied into the structure itself. Uh, most of the time, uh, permanent anchor systems are designed to use with RDS or rope access and they're suspension built uh, anchors and require excessive engineering and certifications. Temporary anchors are temporary fixtures used when working at heights where permanent anchors are not available and practical. They include anchor straps, bolt-in and drop-in anchors, and other temporary structures that can quickly be set up and removed. Another example of a temporary anchor would be a, a doghouse. If you have a doghouse up on a roof and you can wrap it with some, um, some cable, uh, that would be an example of a temporary anchor. Now, keep in mind, anytime that you're using something that is rigging related and you're going to use a fall arrest, that rigging must be new and must have not been used for any other rigging application in the life of that rigging. So if you have some suspension cable from a swing stage that you want to then use for fall arrest line, you could not use that. You would have to have a new piece of cable, new fist grips that you would wrap that, wrap that cable around the doghouse and then bolt that up and you could use that as an anchor. Uh, here's some examples of some different types of temporary anchors that you'll see out there. Um, both acceptable uh, following the manufacturer's instructions to tie in. Uh, the big thing that you need to make sure of when you're putting in uh, temporary anchor solutions is that you have someone that's very competent with the design, both the design element and the uh, uh, installation element of temporary anchor, anchor solutions. They need to be put in according to the manufacturer's instructions, and you need to make sure that the uh, connecting member of the building can withstand the forces of the fall. Portable anchors. And when we talk about portable anchors, this is something that you should be very cautious with. Portable anchors should all, uh, be installed by trained personnel following manufacturer's instruction guidelines. They should be positioned to provide a secure attachment point directly above the worker to minimize fall distances or sometimes directly behind the worker if you're on a leading edge application. Certification and testing may be required to verify strength and integrity of portable anchors, and that's ensure that they can safely support the intended loads. Um, they should only be used if the system has been engineered and you need to be aware of design limitations. So this is the big one that I talk about. If you're gonna use portable anchor solutions, make sure that your people that are putting them out there in the field are very well versed with the application of that system and where they can be used. Sometimes you might even need to consult with an engineer to ensure that that portable anchor solution can be used in the application that you're trying to use it for. And this is a good example of a portable anchor solution. There, um, inspection and maintenance. Regular inspection and maintenance of fall arrest anchors are essential to ensure their continued safety and effectiveness. This includes visual inspections for signs of damage as well uh, in wear, as well as load testing to verify their strength and integrity. Don't trust just that your anchor is okay. Make sure you inspect it. Look at the anchors to see if there's any corrosion or wear. Make sure that any soft points on those anchors are free from any uh, defects, just like you would a harness or a lifeline. Uh, you want to make sure that they're in good shape and that you can use them. And here's some example of some anchors in kind of a bad place, installed incorrectly. Uh, you have an anchor here that's uh, being used incorrectly, that uh, the anchor is not designed for what it's being used for. And then another anchor that's just kind of buried in between, like underneath the roofing membrane uh, that would 
not allow you to inspect that before each use. So now we're getting to certification and compliance. Now, fall arrest anchors must meet specific safety standards and regulations set by organizations like OSHA. And employers are responsible for ensuring that fall arrest anchors are properly installed, inspected, and maintained according to these standards. And there's a lot to that. Um, this is an example of an anchor out on a building uh, that is a, a permanent installation that was installed incorrectly and then reinstalled incorrectly again and again until they got out of the rebar and were able to finally get it in somewhere where they weren't hitting rebar. Uh, this would be dangerous for a multiple, multiple reasons, but the main one is that you've compromised the integrity of that concrete and that anchor is no longer effective. So RDS anchor certification, and this is that big thing that we've been talking about with permanent anchor solutions. We have to look at anchors as not what we're using them for, but what their intended use is. So if you're going to a building, um, more common than not, the anchors on the building are gonna be used for RDS or they're gonna be intended for the use of RDS. And when they are intended for the use of RDS, we have to follow the standard. We have to obtain written information from the building owners, uh, assuring that that permanent anchor solution has been tested, certified and maintained before each use. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of additional rules here, including the ASME 120, you have the, uh, IWCA I-14, which the I-14 has been redacted, but still applies to the construction industry because OSHA 1910.66 refers back to the ICWA I-14. And I know that's a lot, to, a lot to hear and a lot to say, but basically what that means is that every year these anchors have to be visually inspected by someone that's competent to inspect them. And then every 10 years, those anchors have to be tested and they have to be tested under the supervision of a, uh, an engineer. And that professional engineer has to sign off that these anchors uh, meet the specifications that are found in the ICWA, as well as the ASME and ANSI rules. Uh, I would just caution you guys to be careful and not just go out there and use anything that's on the roof. You don't know what's below the roof membrane. And we've seen a lot of anchors that look good on top but then when you start inspecting them or start load testing them, uh, they're corroded or have significant defects down below the roofing membrane. And that is all I have. All right, thank you, Mike. A job well done to both you and Jose. So before um, we go, I just wanna go ahead and do a screen share real fast. All right, just want to remind everyone of a few um, post stand down reminders again, just um, once you guys have completed your stand down, if you guys could go to um, our website and download the sign in sheet and send me the numbers of everyone who participated in this year's stand down, because we then report those numbers directly to OSHA. If you have any um, photos or videos of the stand down, please send those to me as well. And again, you can find um, the sign in sheet and additional stand down resources um, on our web page that is listed right here. Well, thank you again to Jose and Mike. We appreciate your dedication to safety and everything you guys do for the industry and the Institute. Um, if anyone has any questions for our two speakers today, you can find their emails on the screen and you can email the questions directly to them. All right, thank you again for attending um, this year's stand down webinar on leading edge safety. Take care.